much. And before beginning the session, I just wanted to say a few thank yous. I wanted to say thank you for TopCon for uh, organizing and sponsoring this uh, symposium. I actually, reminds me, you know, 12 or 13 years ago, I think we first started working in, in development-wise uh, with the 3D OCT 1000 Mark I. So it's really fantastic to see how the technology has progressed uh, and, the, and the like. Uh, and so I also want to thank uh, uh, the organizers uh, of, the, of the program, Rick Spade, Ramin Tadioni, Eric Sued, uh, and, uh, and Carl Glittenberg. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate that. Oh, looks like my timer's already started. Okay, I'm going to have to get moving then. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Swept Source OCT and OCTA in, in dry AMD. These are my uh, disclosures. Uh, and uh, so uh, in any event, uh, you know, uh, my focus is how has Swept Source OCT enhanced our evaluation of dry AMD and, and GA? And I think the previous speakers, starting with Wolfgang Drexler and also uh, Charles and, uh, and Carl, really emphasized this improved sensitivity with Swept Source OCT, which I think is very helpful for uh, looking at the structures that we're interested in AMD, more consistent visualization of the choroid drusen and some of the outer retinal uh, substructures. But I also want to emphasize that it's not just about the, about the deeper penetration. The other advantage that's very relevant, and I'm going to make that point through some of the, uh, the work I'm going to show, uh, another benefit of subsurface OCT is the dense uh, volume scanning, which allows us to, uh, to avoid missing critical small lesions. That I'll emphasize, I'll highlight in this presentation including features like pigment migration that seem to be very relevant, but also allows us to construct on FOSS images of the retina and choroid, which I think are very relevant to AMD moving forward. So again, this has really, I think, helped us quite substantially in the valuation of atrophy. In fact, actually, you know, when we do these slabs with Swept Source OCT, we actually find one of the best slabs for actually visualizing maybe this pointer is better, visualizing the atrophy is actually at the scleral level because we get such good penetration uh, deep into the retina. So certainly our evaluation of, retina, of atrophy has been quite enhanced by having this high density volume scanning with, uh, with uh, swept service OCT. And in fact, we can recognize uh, this um, abnormality uh, when we take these deeper um, on FOSS slabs. We call this hypertransmission. And of course, recently, uh, the CAM group, Ramin and Rick and others are, are, are part of this, uh, it published uh, the um, uh, criteria for recognizing atrophy on OCT images, because we didn't have a definition, right? We had color and other uh, fundus autofluorescence definitions. We didn't have a, uh, an ability to, rec to, to recognize this uh, uh, consistently, and so we defined this entity, complete RP and outer retinal atrophy, which includes atrophy associated with CNV, but also G uh, GA, which is a subset of this. But in any event, it was defined by, uh, in, in particular, uh, the zone of hypertransmission, uh, which again is really easily revealed uh, on ANFAS uh, OCT, uh, and uh, as well as by noticing uh, or observing attenuation or disruption of the RPE band, but also having evidence of overlying photoreceptor degeneration. So you have these three features, again, this was just published in ophthalmology, uh, and you don't have evidence of an RPE tear, then you can make the diagnosis of atrophy. And in fact, we've already been using this uh, type of a definition to follow atrophy uh, in various settings. Again, it's very helpful in the context of neovascular AMD, where again, it can be very confusing using other imaging modalities to assess for atrophy. It's a very nice tool for tracking atrophy over time. At Macula Society, I'll actually be presenting uh, on, on data from the Harbor study. It'll be the largest analysis of using the CAM criteria to uh, assess atrophy using ANFAS OCT. Uh, but this also appear, already appears to be a useful tool. Again, the high contrast of these areas of hypertransmission uh, on uh, dense uh, volume scanning OCT lends itself to automated segmentation. We and others have published on how this can be done with a high level of repeatability and reproducibility. But there's other things that the ONFOS visualization has been helpful for us in the evaluation of atrophy. We're recognizing, of course, this is an ONFOS slab obtained at the level of the photoreceptors, and everyone recognizes these little structures at the margin that can be seen. We see in about 20% of GA lesions. Uh, in any event, uh, what are these structures? Actually, uh, Rick Spade and Bailey Freund were one of the first to describe these as being areas of outer retinal tubulation, which are sort of little areas where the photoreceptors are rolled up. Maybe I say 
like huddled together for dear life trying to survive. And it's interesting uh, that, uh, that, you know, these, this is not just a trivial observation. We think it has some importance because we did observe in the Mahalo study, we published this in ophthalmology as well, that patients who had evidence of these tubulations seem to grow or have their atrophy enlarge at a slower rate. So I actually find that to be a helpful feature. And we've actually been very interested in tracking the evolution of these using UNFAS OCT. It's kind of interesting as you track these along, they always connect back to the edge, but there is sort of a dieback over time. I've always viewed these as sort of conduits that are trying to keep the photoreceptors at the very edge alive, but you know, obviously you can only do that so long with conduit. Once it gets long enough, I think it's, you're sort of over the cliff. Uh, also, uh, Swepsters OCT and geography um, uh, um, it can be very helpful. Jim Fujimoto, I thought, gave a beautiful talk explaining how we can utilize this in assessing atrophic um, lesions. Uh, we can certainly um, uh, look at the areas uh, in the bed of atrophy where because of absence of the RP in the choriocapillaris, you can actually see flow signal without using vasculographic techniques to see uh, the larger blood vessels. But it's interesting to see the areas of preservation further outside the atrophy, but again, Jim really highlighted that, that junction zone uh, where there can be a flow impairment. But in addition, what we're observing in these areas of atrophy uh, associated with GA is that even within the bed of atrophy, we can identify areas of partial preservation of the chorea capillaris. And they may be important, it's just another example, it's that case I showed earlier, but now you can see the OCTA image. Again, you can see some patchy areas of chorea capillaris preservation. And Giovanni Strenghi has pointed out that perhaps this could be useful in distinguishing the origin of atrophy as you oftentimes uh, see areas of preservation in in, in GA eyes associated with AMD as opposed to, for example, atrophy and other disorders like Stargardt's. I want to step back in the last uh, section of my talk, and I might go just a minute over because I started uh, behind, uh, but uh, it, it to talk a little bit about the earlier stages of dry AMD before atrophy develops, because that's actually been a real focus area for us. We were one of the first to publish some paper in ophthalmology a few years ago now, that these features, these little hyperreflective foci within drusen, and especially this type of feature, this hyperreflective fo focus in the retina, uh, which uh, we think represent areas of pigment migration, they seem to be very important predictors of which areas go on to develop atrophy within the fundus. Rick Spade taught us a lot about uh, reticulous pseudodrusen or subretinal drusenoid deposits and their relevance uh, in terms of substantially increasing your risk of developing both type 3 neovascularization as well as, uh, as, as, well as uh, atrophy, uh, and that's been verified in a number of different uh, studies now. Uh, in addition, we observe, and this is probably not very surprising, that if you have a lot of drusen in the very center, high central drusen volume, that appears to be associated to, to be a risk factor for atrophy, and that was confirmed in this sub-study from the AIRREDS-2 study, which again, observe the importance of central uh, drusen volume. In fact, we've had four or five papers now that have verified these risk factors. Every single study, uh, we always find that these appear to be important risk factors. Maybe this pigment migration seemed to be, seeming to be the most important. So we wondered, can we take these risk factors? Because I look for every, every patient I see in clinic, I'm looking for these things. I use this in my everyday clinical practice. But we said, can we turn this into a simple score? that we can use to assess our patients. So we drew inspiration from the ARID study where they said, well, you know, if we just look for large drusen and pigment changes and give a point to each, that could be used to help us stage AMD or risk assess our patients. So we said, well, we've got more than that in terms of four different OCT risk factors, but why not do the same thing, give a point to each eye if you had one of those features. So you could add this up and see, yeah, I can get a total of eight, eye, eight points for, for both eyes. And we thought, well, maybe people complain that's too many points, so you can just divide it by two if you'd like, so you can still have four if you like four. But it does seem to neatly predict the risk for progression to developing advanced AMD over um, 18 months. So you can really, so I use this in terms of planning my follow-up for patients. Like obviously if a patient with a lot of those factors, I might want to see them sooner than someone who has none. So I think that could be very useful. But so far, all I've shown you is sort of a qualitative assessment, and it was intentional because we wanted something that I can quickly do in clinic on every patient. But the question is, can we actually improve the prediction with a more quantitative approach? This is where I think Swepsters OCT is very useful because we get these dense volumes that I think lend themselves to, uh, to quantification of different structures. For example, we can see all of these little sort of hyperreflective cores in these various drusen, and we've really gotten very interested now in being able to quantify these things. You actually can do a pretty good job, actually, of quantifying these areas of hyperreflective drusen uh, within the, the drusen volume. In addition, I mean, what's harder actually to do is quantifying the subretinal drusenoid deposits. I mean, yes, we can see them quite nicely on the areas, uh, uh, it's not projecting so well here, uh, but on the, um, on the, on the 
on this uh, on FOSS image from the surface of OCT, and we can sort of loosely sort of quantify them. Frank Holtz and others have done things of that sort, and that seems to actually add some predictive value as well. But the big one, the big feature that seems to be most helpful are identifying these interretinal hyperreflective foci or areas of pigment migration, and you can actually, uh, um, actually quantify them actually now. In fact, this is uh, from recent work done by my fellow Marco Nassisi from Torino, uh, who demonstrated that our prediction, just using this alone, no other factor, it actually, you can see that quantifying them actually gave us additional predictive value compared to just a yes, no, are they present or not. So we think quantification has a role. Uh, lastly, I'll just finish by talking about swept surface OCT angiography in your media AMD. Can that add to our prediction? Enrico Borelli, uh, my fellow from, uh, from Milano, had shown that uh, choriocapillary flow voids in intermediate AMD eyes were larger, um, uh, but he had to study them. The limitation of this paper that was published in IOVS is because of the loss of signal with spectral domain OCT, we kind of had to look at the choriocapillaries around the drusen, not directly below the drusen. We still saw this increase in the flow void. So this is where I think swept surface OCT can help us because we actually get very good imaging of the choriocapillaris even when it's behind these thick drusen. I mean, Carl showed some nice examples of that. And we were able to demonstrate, again, more uh, nice work from Enrico, we were able to demonstrate a further reduction or increase, I guess, in the flow voids underneath the drusen compared to uh, at areas further distance away. So there seems to be some relationship between this and where the drusen appear. So in any event, to summarize, swept surface OCT and OCTA have further, I think, enhanced our evaluation of early and late dry AMD, giving us better visualization, automated quantification of GA, uh, but also allowing us to identify and quantify some of these risk factors, which I think are really important uh, for atrophy, and I think they've given us new insights into disease pathophysiology and progression. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much.